Andy Johnson, Minnesota State University. We are looking at the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test, the revised normative update. With any standardized measure, you must ask yourself, is it valid? Does it predict students' ability to create meaning with print? And that is what reading is. It is creating meaning, not barking at print. Or does it simply predict their ability to perform on a similar test of reading subskills? Does it provide diagnostic data? Does it tell you what kind of instruction is needed? Are the testing conditions similar to real life reading situations? Do they enable the reader to use all three queuing systems, phonics, syntax, and semantics? And does it tell us what queuing systems students use? What are their strengths and weaknesses? I have found that most standardized tests are based on this outdated model, the phonological processing model, that simply defines reading as sounding out words. Words appear on the page, you sound them out, use the phonological processing, a little thing right here, boop, 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 and then that information goes to the cortex. The transactive model is based on the latest research in neurocognitive psychology, brain imaging, says that reading is an interactive process, a meaning-making process. We use three cueing systems to identify words, but identifying words is simply part of creating meaning with text. There is much more information flowing from the cortex down to the thalamus than the thalamus up during the reading process, meaning we use what's in our head to create meaning. All right, part one of the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test is called a readiness cluster. It's comprised of these three things. And again, ask yourself, how does this relate to the transactive model of reading? Is it a meaning-making process? Visual auditory learning is the first part. It measures the ability to form associations between visual stimuli and oral responses. It measures, measures. Is this creating meaning with print? Does this recognize the three cueing systems? Is this predictive of anything? Students learn rebus-like graphics for familiar words and use them to read a sentence. A rebus is a representation of a word or symbol using pictures, right? So this tells us something, but is this an authentic meaning-making situation? It tells us something, but I'm not quite sure what that something is. Object naming is another readiness component. You point to something and students have to tell you what it is, and it is time. They have to do it quickly. I want to see how quickly you can name the objects on this card. Ready? Go! However, their ability and their speed at this is going to be affected by students' concept knowledge, by their vocabulary knowledge, by their exposure, and by their culture. All right? So uh, it tells us something, but what is it really measuring? Does it focus on students' ability to create meaning with print? Second component is letter identification, measures the ability to identify letters. These are presented in uh, various forms. Again, identifying letters. What does this have to do with creating meaning with print and the transactive model? Students are asked to identify 27 letters quickly. Again, this is time. This is criterion referenced, all right? This is the criterion. Can you meet the criterion? I want to see how quickly you can name the letters on this card. Go! And again, we're looking at speed of processing. Phonological awareness. This is kind of a readiness test. Beginning sounds, technically this is phonemic awareness, the ability to hear sounds within words and manipulate them. These are teeth. Find the picture that starts with the same sound as teeth. Tape, bean, and sail. T -t. So it's the ability to hear sounds. Is that predictive of your ability to create meaning with print? Same with ending sounds. The ability to hear sounds within words. This is broom. Find the thing that has the same ending sound as broom. Frog stick dime. Ma, ma. All right, the ability to hear sounds. Middle sounds. What word rhymes with cat? Has the same mini, a meaning sound. All right, what word rhymes? It's okay to make up a word if you want to. That's right. Rhymes with cat. So they have to come up with a word. They have to generate. All right. If you're exposed to more words, more concepts, you're more apt to do better 
on this, all right? Does it predict their ability to create meaning with print? Is this an authentic reading situation? Blending sounds. I'm going to say a word one at, part at a time. Listen, pop, corn. Tell me what word this makes. Pop, corn, all right? The ability to blend things. Bay, B, baby. Good, 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 all right? What does this measure? What does it predict? Deleting sounds. Say pancake without pan. That's right. Pancake without pan is cake. Let's try another one. All right. Deleting sounds, manipulating sounds, phonemic awareness. The research I've read on phonemic awareness says it is correlated with reading achievement, but correlation does not infer causation. Oftentimes, students who are exposed to a lot of books and reading at home, they show high incidence of phonemic awareness. This does not mean that it predicts anything. It's correlated. It does not infer causation. Again, reading is an interactive process. We use the three cueing systems of the three systems. The phonological system is the least efficient. This Woodcock Reading Mastery Test seems to be focused only on the phonological cueing system and on just small parts of the phonological cueing system. So it measures something, but just very little parts of that something. Part two is the basic skills cluster, word identification, word attack. Again, three cueing systems. It's looking at just one cueing system and it's just a very small part of that cueing system. And it's based on the outdated, outdated phonological processing model instead of the transactive model. Students are asked to read a list of words in isolation. But reading a list in isolation is not creating print, all right? When you read, you usually see words in context. So you're able to use context clues, syntax clues, as well as word analysis, morphemic analysis, and phonics to identify words. So this is not an authentic reading situation. Reading is the ability to create meaning with print not to sound out words. There's no context. What are these words? You, not, all right? And again, ignores the most significant cueing systems, which are semantics and syntax. This is not real reading. Mature readers, when you and I read, we use syntax and semantics much more than letter cues. Here's one that's the most controversial. Students are given 45 nonsense words and asked to sound them out, all right? And again, students cannot use semantics or syntax clues. What are these words? Blip, duds, we, or why. This isn't real reading. You cannot make sense out of nonsense. This is barking at print. That's why these types of measures must be uh, taken with many, many grains of salt. All right, part three, reading comprehension. This comes the closest to the transactive model and reading as meaning making. Students are given a word and asked to generate antonyms, synonyms, and analogies. This is said to demonstrate their word knowledge, but is or generating words, is that the same as creating meaning or comprehending? For example, read this word out loud and tell me it's opposite, bad, is this looking at word knowledge or the ability to create meaning with text? The exposure to words and concepts is going to affect your results here. And again, is this analyzing, creating meaning with print? When we look at standardized measures, we have to look at what they predict. Do they predict students' ability to create meaning with print? Or do they predict students' ability to do equally well on a equally uh, nonsensical type of measure. And it is my opinion that there's parts of this Woodcock reading mastery test that do not make sense from a transactive point of view. Synonyms. Read this word out loud and tell me another word that means the same. Gift, mug, all right, tell me another word. And again, they're having to generate to find associations. Your knowledge of word, your exposure to things is going to affect your results here. And I know vocabulary knowledge is important. Vocabulary is correlated with comprehension, but correlation does not infer causation. Words and concepts you have been exposed to will affect your results 
are students creating meaning with print? Is this a realistic reading situation? Analogy. Red is to stop as green is to, all right? And again, words, concepts, thinking, does this have to do with creating meaning with print? Now this one, passage comprehension. Students are given a passage, a short paragraph, each containing a missing word. Students are asked to read each segment and supply the missing word. This is the one meaning-making part of this. Read this to yourself and tell me what word belongs here, all right? You're having to use the information in your head to create meaning. The girl plays with her, and they have to identify the word, okay? And I'm okay with this. The cat is standing on a blank in the doorway. They're able to use both picture clues, syntax, and semantics to identify the correct word. There are two additional subtests. Listening comprehension. Point to the child who is running, all right? Listening, comprehending, making sense of that, all right? You're creating meaning here. I'm not quite sure what that measures. Listening comprehension. Jordan goes running with his sisters. Otherwise, he goes for a bike ride. Point to the picture that shows what Dor Jordan does on Saturday morning, all right? Is that listening? Is that remembering? Is that understanding the picture and the passage? I'm not quite sure. And then oral reading fluency. Read this out loud. I'm going to keep track, but don't rush reading your regular voice, all right? So they're ha given a passage and they're timed. However, any type of fluency measure must be taken with many grains of salt because when we, you and I, are reading, when we're checking for comprehension or it's confusing, we read slowly and we go back and correct. That's a mature reading behavior. Also, the level of reading and the type of reading and the uh, 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 what you're reading about affects the reading rate. So reading rates should always be presented in context taken with many grains of salt. Let's review. With any standardized measure, you must ask, is it valid? Does it predict what it purports to predict? Does it measure what it purports to measure? Does it predict students' ability to create meaning with print? Or does it predict their ability to perform on a similar test of reading subscales? If it predicts their ability simply to do well on another test, that would not be a valid measure. Does it provide diagnostic data? Does it tell you what instruction is needed? This is the problem. We know students can't read, but why can't they read? Now, I'm not saying the Woodcock Reading Mastery Test should not be used. It should be used with other types of data. Are the testing conditions similar to real-life reading situations? Do they enable the reader to use three queuing systems? And does it tell us the student's strengths and weaknesses? My recommendation is that, okay, go ahead and use the Woodcock, but you get much more diagnostic data from some type of diagnostic reading assessment, an informal reading inventory, or a qualitative reading inventory. Also, miscue analysis, where you're listening to them read out loud and you're noting the type of miscues they make, that's a more authentic meaning-making situation. Woodcock Reading Mastery Test provides general data, but by itself, it's not sufficient for diagnosing and for informing instruction.